Hey guys, welcome. This is Lucid and we're gonna be doing a guide on late age tea and chi. Now this has been commissioned by Ann Callaghan and I wanna especially thank him and all the rest of the Patreon supporters. Uh, I mean, for those of you who don't know, the YouTube ad revenue for these videos is like almost nothing. And uh, I'm not living hand to mouth or anything uh, depending on the YouTube revenue. Uh, but it honestly just makes me feel really nice to know that people care enough to support uh, the channel by by donating money on Patreon. So uh, special thanks to him um, for commissioning this video. And I'm actually glad he did because Late Age TNG is a nation I've talked about a few times. Uh, I've mentioned in passing in different ways. And uh, I'm really excited to make a video about them because they are super fucking cool. Uh, they have a lot of really cool uh, mechanics. And I actually really like all the TNG nations. Uh, I think Sakane had gotten really into TNG. He liked early age, he liked middle age, he liked late age. He got really into them. I've kind of been getting into them lately too. Um, a lot of the nations are very similar era to era. And late age TNG is very different era to era. They have some of the same summons, but man, they change a ton from age to age. They tend to keep some of like the, the infantry options from different eras in the past, but the mage core changes a lot. Uh, I think they keep the master of the way the whole time. But aside from him, pretty much everything changes. They keep a Celestial Master, but it's a different Celestial Master for each age. Like at the beginning, he can like fly around and shit, but by the end, he's kind of like a lower path mage. Um, yeah. So um, I'm gonna tell you real quick what each of the TNCs are. So the early age TNC is a nation of sacreds, right? You get Warriors of the Five Elements, which are these awesome sacreds. You can turn almost all of your gem types into sacreds, which are good. So you get this like wide variety of really cool sacreds. Um, yeah, I mean, they're super duper cool. Middle age, uh, the, the mages though in early age are like kind of good. Like you have to, like early age TNG, you're really figuring out creative ways to use these guys. And we'll talk about how to use them, but you're like kind of stuck with these guys and then also using master of the five elements and uh, celestial masters uh from the from your cap so i don't know it's an interesting kind of tricky i i think playing early age tng really well like requires a lot of skill but it has some instruments of like raw power and blunt force which you can kind of just bulldoze your enemy with which means it's usually good for like newer players too so it's a really interesting nation it's all about sacreds by middle age it's now about efficiency and bureaucracy and communions and uh, like scales troops for the most part. It's a really interesting nation and like it has all these little parts that just sort of fit together. Uh, it's very, very cool. I'll probably be doing a guide on them at some point. Um, by late age, we are now in like the Mongol hordes cover the world in horses and all sorts of things. And um, I don't really have a pretender I'm going to show you. We're going to talk through the nation, and then I'll do pretender design at the end. And we'll kind of just freestyle that. We're going to talk about, like, what it can do, like, different things to, to consider. Um, the first thing we have to talk about when we talk about uh, late age TNG is we have to talk about barb heavy horsemen. So um, look when I hover over this. So this one says, can be recruited outside Fort Walls as well. Can be recruited out of uh, Fort Walls as well. So that's these two. Now this first guy, he has a light lance and a composite crossbow and costs 20 gold. This next guy has a heavy lance, all right? Uh, he gets a big fucking charge bonus. Um, whereas I think the light lance, my charge bonus, does, oh, does it not say heavy weapon or whatever it says? Oh, heavy weapon, yeah, there it is, I was missing it. So he gets a heavy charge bonus. Um, on a big freaking lance, it's going to wallop the dog crap out of somebody. 18 damage charge attack with a heavy weapon versus like a 13 damage charge attack. I mean, these guys are going to light somebody up when they first hit them. I mean, it's no different than other heavy calf, but the, what's important about this guy is most heavy calf, like we're in late age. You guys watch my Bogarus, uh, playthrough and whatnot. Uh, guys, Bogarus, they get like 40 gold 
and God, it might even be 50 gold. Like, Melia and Drazina are freaking expensive. This is half price, and not like half upkeep, like half price, which also means half upkeep. And these guys are so freaking cheap. It is ridiculous. They're the cheapest cab unit that I can think of. Um, and they're amazing. They're absolutely amazing. They've got 15 defense, 15 protection. They've got a Falchion, which is a great... Uh, it's a super high damage single-handed weapon. So like, okay, let like let me just show you. So okay, like I mean just compare it to this guy. He's got a light lance with just 13 damage. You're like, okay, piercing is kind of nice. This is 18 damage. This is way better. I mean, this is a very high quality melee attack. And then he's got the hoof, which is pretty good, and then a composite crossbow. I mean, guys, composite crossbows are good. They're good. Like, you can, I mean, you can totally set the, like, normally, a lot of times, so, like, if you look at Raga, Late Age Raga, they have units that are, like, 40 gold heavy cab, and they've got a bow on them. You don't really want them to use the bow most of the time, right? Like, they're mostly cav. You can put them where they're, like, if you're running cold Raga or something, you've got a lot of archers, you can use them as a front line, and they'll be like, okay, once the front line you know, they're like a really durable front line and then they'll eventually charge in, right? But like most of the time for Cav, you don't really want to use the bow. It's too expensive. You know, like Bogarus, they get some foreign recruit guy that's got a bow, but he's garbage compared to this dude. Like this guy is sick. And like you can totally make the case for massing these guys and putting them on fire. Can absolutely make the case. In fact, it may be the optimal move against various types of crossbow nations. Because you're going to fire twice as quickly, and you've got a shield and decent protection. You'll trade very well gold for gold versus a lot of crossbow nations. Um, of course, there's like asterisks and caveats about all these things. But uh, in principle, it should kind of work okay. Uh, precision is not great. So uh, there's a, <laughs> a quality and quantity when you're outputting uh, a, a big volley of fire here. But this guy is amazing. The things that are important about him, they cost a decent but not an extremely high amount of resources and recruitment points. Um, but you're going to be able to get these guys out of all of your fort. I mean, out of all of your lands. So this can just the fact that this guy exists affects so much about the tempo and way you play this nation. Because like most of the time, you get a lot of gold in expansion, but you're putting most of that gold into infrastructure early, right? So it delays the rate at which you build up power, right? Because, like, before you can, like, put a lot of gold into an army, you have to first put it into infrastructure. Uh, Lei Tian Chi can put a lot of money into an army reasonably quickly. It's pretty potent. So, Barb Heavy Horsemen, this is what makes this unit, like, a horde faction. They also have Pillager 2, uh, which, interestingly enough, we figured out doesn't actually make them pillage effectively. Loggy found some bugs in the code. Does not work. Um, they don't pillage better. What it does let them do is it lets them do the, the raid command, uh, especially as commanders. But I think it, it may help them actually as raiders when doing the raid command. Now, some of you might be like, what, raid attack a province? No, it's like a separate command that you can only do if you have pillage. As a, as a trait. And it has to be on the commander, but it may also help to have it on the troops. Um, anyway, you basically have this guy, which is like, he doesn't cost many resources. So if you're only using these guys to mass, cross, to mass the composite bows, you can get a lot more of them quickly. The, and for some targets, this actually would be optimal. Like maybe if you're fighting Ulm and you want to overwhelm his crossbows with these guys. Maybe. But these guys, they have a better shield. They're going to trade a lot better against crossbows. They cost the same amount of money. They're just twice as many resources, but they're so much better. Okay, that is like the thing we have to talk about at the beginning is these guys are amazing. The caveat, and this is going to reply to our cap only sacred, which is this dude. The caveat with all of these is you have to understand how melee units, like units you want in melee, are going to work when they have a ranged option attached to them. So this is like the warden for man, uh, like foresters for man, um, like these guys, like a lot of things that you want in melee that have bows. How they're going to work is if you give them a command, like let's say you put these guys on hold and attack, 
They'll shoot for the first couple turns while they're waiting. That's nice. And then they'll run forward and attack. As soon as, like, if you put attack closest, as soon as the squad they run into dies, that they've, you know, they've killed it, they will make a decision. Is there something really close to me? And if so, I'll poke it with my spear. If not, um, I'm going to shoot. And so they can transition into a ranged unit when you want them to be a like a badass melee unit. And this can be very annoying. Um, in short, it's very difficult in the way this is implemented in the game. And I, I hope this would actually get fixed. Like, I feel like this is pretty much a bug. Like, when you do hold an attack, you really shouldn't shoot more. Or maybe there should be, like, another option or something. Like, don't fucking shoot. Because it's pretty annoying when this happens. And it really messes up nations like Man, where you have the Wardens who have this big fucking two-handed sword and they're chopping stuff down. But sometimes they're like, nah, let's switch to the crossbow. You're like, no! Like, I almost got killed by Utgard in that one game just because my stupid wardens wouldn't follow instructions and attack people with their big goddamn swords. Anyhow, I digress. Um, it's very important, though, and there's no clean solution. Usually the cleanest solution is something like attack rear, and then you at least won't... Like, if you put them where they're going to, like, a ball in the middle, not on the... If you don't put them in a flank, like, you put them to hit the middle, and they hit the middle, if they're targeting something in the back, they're not going to switch to shooting until they get to the back, which is going to mean killing everything in between there and then. So that's the best solution. Is you put, if you want to attack the rear, do hold an attack rear. The problem is if you're flanking with that, you can, like, maybe kill... Like, they could just have, like, a few, like, a small archer squad of, like, five dudes, right? You attack rear, you hit them, and they're like, okay, job's done. And then what do they do? They just switch to shooting. And you're like, god damn it. So anyway, that is how these guys work. Uh, it's a very important kind of mechanic to deal with, and it can be very annoying. The good news is they will only shoot for 12 turns, and then they'll run out of ammo and attack. If that didn't exist, these guys would be even more powerful. Like, if that, I'll call it a bug, didn't exist, they would be even better. Um, but it does. Um, it's manageable, but it's annoying. It's very annoying. Um, we'll continue talking about the cav. You also get um, cap-only cav. Now, these guys are a little bit better. The barb heavy horsemen, they've got 15 defense. Here we've got 16. Barb heavy horsemen had 17 uh, protection. We have, I mean, I'm sorry, 15 protection. We have 17 these guys have 12 hit points. These guys have 14. We also have more strength. I think the attack skill is better too by, his, by two as well. So two more um, strength, three more attack skill. Or no, two more attack skill. They're just a better version. They're two and a half times more expensive though, I want to point out. But only about like 30% more resources. So a very moderate... And at the beginning of the game, resource cost is usually more important than gold cost. Um... Which, by the way, is potentially another argument to make the barb heavy horsemen, because these guys normally you're always going to want to make the heavy ones. But, like I said, at the beginning of the game, uh, resource efficiency matters more than gold efficiency. But these guys are way fucking better than these dudes, so it may still be better if you're going to do scales expansion to use these guys. Um, okay, so basically it's a better heavy calf. Um, they have similar upkeep. They have the upkeep of a 25 gold unit because they're sacred. So, um, you know, that's worth considering. Um, yeah, they're basically the same in terms of the weaponry, except instead of a composite bow, they have a howling bow. The howling bow does magic damage, which incidentally is going to also give it a slightly better chance to bypass shields. I believe that's how that works, which is very strange. Normally magic damage, this is not, it doesn't work that way for swords or anything like that. But only for ranged weapons, magic ranged weapons tend to bypass shields a little bit better if I if my memory serves, which it's been faltering lately, but that's another story. Um, yeah. It additionally has, and I don't actually know how this works. I don't know if this is two fear proc. I don't actually know what this number means, too. It will cause fear, though, when it hits. A big squad of these guys pummeling an army 
with fear inducing things while especially if they're taking like real attrition from other archer fire can be kind of devastating um yeah so i mean that's basically i, I don't know what you, what you want me to say about them um we're going to talk about blessed strats because there are blessed strats that i think do make sense and I'll, I'll, I'll just mention them. You can do a lot of different things, right? There's a kind of versatile sacred. I don't think this is the kind of sacred. Like, given one thing, like, a sacred can be good, but the question is, like, what's the opportunity cost? Like, if I invest in a bless, it's going to make everything else that doesn't have a, a sacred tag on it effectively more expensive. And what's significant about that is these guys fucking exist. They're good. They're so good. Oh, my God. So... The, the more we dump into a bless for this guy, the less money we're going to have to make these. All right? That's the trade-off. That said, I think there's some pretty cool blesses you can do with them. I mean, you can do like a stat bless where you get their attack and defense high. You can stack up strength and take advantage of its cav with a 20 damage falchion on it. Um, so there's a lot of ways to play it. I think an interesting way is a weapon bless. Um, and the reason is because Weapon Blast is also going to work with well with some of the late game options we're going to have, which we'll talk about. Um, the rest of the troops, uh, noticeably missing is the Crossbow, which we had in Middle Age, which is now gone. Uh, we still have a Composite Bow, so you can mask these guys uh, as 10 gold Composite Bows. Uh, the problem is they're basically way shittier than these dudes, because these guys, are when they run out of ammo, are going to be murder machines. And they have a shield. So if you're trading archer fire, they're going to trade better, I think, than these dudes, even though these guys are half the price. You'll be able to put up more quantity of fire. So maybe if you have these like in the back and you don't think they'll get hit and you have like the horses in front, but they're also going to be less mobile. These guys have map move 12. These guys are a casual map move 14. Pretty quick. I think these guys are faster, 18. This is another reason to consider getting these guys. These guys are 16 in between, but 18, 14's pretty far. It's only two faster than this, actually. But that that too can matter, because you're basically right on the threshold between map move one or map move two. Um so yeah, I mean you can make them. I, I don't I would have a hard time really recommending that. Um uh, I mean composite bows are good against some nations in late age that are massing crossbows. So it's something to consider. Uh, a lot of the other troops are the same from like middle age. Um, these guys are notable for just having, it's a pretty low attack skill. It's only nine attack, which for like expensive-ish medium infantry, like it costs a decent amount of resources and gold. It's not like amazing. You know, you gotta, that, I mean, that it doesn't seem like it. You're like, oh, it hits really hard. And it does. But I'm just saying that my that attack penalty only being at nine matters. It's not trivial. Um, you also have pikemen here, which are kind of interesting. So I'm not going to go through all the troops. You can read them; they're all reasonably priced. Um, the ones I would probably consider using most are uh, these guys, depending archers. Um, these glaive guys for taking down like elite units, like guys that have a lot of protection that are relying on protection mostly. Um, these guys, if you need a front line against crossbows, because they've got this big fucking tower shield and decent protection. Um, you can also do these guys if you're worried about crossbows. They're easier to spam. Um, and then the pikes will have certain places where people are really relying heavily on repel, because this obviously it's going to be hard to repel a pike. And um, it's reasonably a high damage weapon. It's not really bad. I think these are totally fine to mass. The only problem is they're a little sad and will get plinked away by actual elite infantry most of the time. Um, but certain types of infantry in late age will have really bad defense. And if they have really bad defense, it's a time to consider using footmen because units with bad defense and not great morale are easily repelled. And so if you see that situation, you can go ahead and make the footmen. Okay, that's all the time we're going to spend talking about the units uh, for now. Uh, let's go up to the commanders. We've got a few different kinds. We've got a general, 80 leadership. Hey, we can do formations. We've got this guy, 120 leadership. Hey, we get bonus morale. Uh, that could be really important. Um, ceremonial masters can bless these dudes. 
Uh, Masters of the Wave. These... It's, we have to talk about them. This guy is common to all the middle-aged TNGs. So if I ever do a middle-aged TNG video, here is the, the, the thing. You start off with the water path. You get either water, air. There's not a lot you can do with water, air, guys. I'm going to be totally honest with you. You can drop little air elementals. You can do storm power if you get storm up. And then these guys can do lightning bolt is probably one of the worst paths. You can maybe do like freezing mists or something, but honestly, you don't really have the paths for it. You have to have like a booster and then another booster. I think it's like water three, air one. I mean, we can look. It's, um, wait, whoops. Uh, here we go. Freezing mist, yeah, water three, air one. Okay, it's not, it's not easy to do. These aren't great. Water twos are amazing. They can cast quickness until they go blue in the face. Uh, you can do water elementals with them. You can put uh, like uh, the water bracelet on them and then become water three. Water four is actually really nice for dropping stuff like liquefy, but these are super solid mages. Quickness is great. Like if you have a water two and his whole job is to drop quickness on, I will remind you, these guys who are sitting there for 10 turns while they empty, or 12 turns, while they empty all their arrows, they're all getting quickened, and then they run in with quickness as like little murder whirlwind machines. That's pretty good. Okay, so we've established the water randoms are good. What about the astral randoms? Uh, we got guys that are sitting there waiting to be point buffed while we plink the enemy full of arrows. Uh, might as well be putting luck or body ethereal, depending on which one's better in that case, on everybody. Additionally, they'll be able to jump in communions. And unlike middle-aged TNG, which is a communion nation, uh, this nation's not, but it can do it. Um, your astral ones are going to be valuable for that, so you really don't... You want to be careful about how many you sacrifice, because they're really going to be your communion slaves. So, while on one hand, it's like, okay, the astral ones are great, because we can cover our guys in like body ethereal and luck. Uh, you also kind of need to save them to be your communion masters uh, for your celestial masters. Um, and then these guys that we're going to talk about, they can all random astral, right? So for whatever paths they're going to bring to the table, you want to throw them in a communion. You need some slaves. You could use these guys as slaves, but they cost 220 gold. Guess who's an astral one slave who only costs 135? These guys, right? So, do you bring them out to point buff? I don't know. I would be inclined. My suggestion, if you need to point buff, do it. right? But my suggestion is what you would aim to do would be to save these guys to be your communion slaves. The astral ones. Okay, that's how I would primarily think about them. Because if you could just make a ton of them, it'd be like, yeah, you just make a ton of astral ones. But you can't. You're only going to get so many, one in four. Now, you could say that makes the price of these guys way higher as communion slaves. But the thing is, is these other guys you're making are going to be super useful. Like, the air ones are probably going to sit in the lab and research. Unless you can think of some use that I can't. Um, and all these other three are very useful. The water one's super useful. The astral one is probably the best, uh, depending on the nation. Like, in, in middle age, well, the water one's not actually very important. The other ones are better. But, because they've got plenty of astral mages already... Uh, and late age, again, the Asher one's super important. Now, uh, for nature, uh, I think you guys know what nature is. It's going to be, well, first of all, we can do protection and, like, the normal nature stuff, but we can do moss body. So this is like painting your dudes with moss body. Pretty good. Okay. So we've talked about the master of the way. Next up, we have basically three guys. And you can get these all in any forts, but they're kind of expensive. Um, I think they're all old. Yeah, so they all have old age, which is annoying. They're all sacred, so I think you can mitigate old age by taking uh, unaging, which is worth thinking about. Um, sadly, you don't get disease healers, which mitigate... Like, it's one of the things about middle age TNG that's kind of cool. You get old units, but you have dis disease healers, so you don't lose a lot of them. Um, not the case here. So, uh, anyway... They're all a little different. They all have death paths, though. And that's going to be pretty important for the late game. We'll talk about that. The first guy here is possibly the most useful early. 
uh, Earth 2 Death 1. He gets these randoms. So um, he can be um, Earth 2 Air 1 with the Death Path. That's pretty useful for doing like Rain of Stones. Uh, he, which a lot of our guys should have shields. So if you're fighting a nation without shields, uh, Rain of Stones is pretty good. Um, the Astra one, super nice. You can plug everything into a communion. The Death one, Earth 2, Death 2, you can do Skelly Spam pretty well. Like summon Earth Power and then Skelly Spam. Not bad to consider, especially... Um, one thing to think about when you're taking unaging or not is if these guys are primarily going to buff, like if his job is to like cast uh, summon earth power and then shrink the giants three times and then go to sleep for the rest of combat, not a big deal that he has high encumbrance, high encumbrance of eight, right? Two of which is coming from old age, three of which is coming from the armor. You know, that's okay. If, however... Um, you know, you want them to be doing like a retail stuff, like a skelly spam. So the death random, he's earth to death to. Maybe you put a skull staff on him because he can make skull staffs with a hammer for only seven gems, which is reasonable, right? And maybe some earth boots on him. You want him to sit there and like spam out long dead until he's blue in the face. Like, so any kind of like retail spam spell, the encumbrance starts mattering a lot more. You get rid of two encumbrance. It's basically two reinvigoration for also taking care of your old age problem. Um, it's worth thinking about. And it's definitely worth thinking about taking on aging for this. So it depends a little bit how you want to use your mages. Um, and finally, the nature random uh, opens up possibility of things like gay is blessing and stuff. Uh, but anyway, that's that. Um, the most important thing that I, this guy, well, anytime you see an Earth 2 Mage for a Nation, it means you have some really good early power spikes, like Legions of Steel, Strength of Giants. These are not point buff spells. These are area of effect spells. Area of effect spells are better on, like, nations that have a lot of units. And guys, guess what? We are a nation with a lot of units. Like, oh my god, so many units. Because we're going to be... Potentially, depending how you want to play them, you can play them lots of different ways, and they're all viable, but maybe not all equally good. Um, you can have a lot of these heavy horsemen really early, and they become a lot better when they get bonus 3 protection, so they're 18 protection and bonus 4 strength, so that this is now doing a tidy 22 damage. All right, and the cross composite bow is going to be doing more damage as well, too. So the easiest... It's worth mentioning while we're here. The easiest early game strat where you can just completely overwhelm somebody is you make some of these guys out of your capital and you don't really worry about other forts for a while. I mean, you do when you have money to buy them, but you don't just... You're going to be making these guys... Sorry, these guys in every single fort. I mean, not fort. Uh, province. And you have to hire some commanders and go move them around all the time. Like You have to have a pretty active logistics network. But if you do that, and you spam these guys, and you put Strength of Giants, you do Summon Earth Power, Strength of Giants, Legions of Steel, so that's three things you need to get to three. Conjuration, Enchantment, and Construction. And you paint that over this whole horde of horsemen, there's a very good chance you will just completely overwhelm somebody. And that's your early game. Um, that can actually expand, like continue into the early mid game. Like until turn 30, you just absolutely bleeding these guys and attacking people uh you can play really really aggressively with this nation the problem is is you might get too big like it, you want to be big right like you're playing a nation that has a lot of power early like you want to use it and get a good position but is it really worth getting that little extra bit bigger where every single one of your neighbors attacks you probably not so you know um, and if you're not going to be fighting, like if you roll over somebody for your first war, you know, do you start your second war? It's up to you. If you can do it and then you can fight off all your neighbors after that, you can just win the game from that and have like a 40 turn game. But, um, depends how you want to play. Um, if you win your first war, it may be you're going to stop spamming these dudes quite as much.
you know, you, you make some, but you start focusing more on mages or something else. Uh, anyway. But anyway, th there's an amazing timing with these dudes early and these dudes. Um, next up, you have the Spirit Master. Now, this is going to give us another major buff. Nature 2, also very good for area of effect buffs. We get Wooden Warriors from this. So we can now paint these guys, who have zero natural protection, with a ton of Wooden Warriors. So they're going to go up. Imagine we have Strength of Giants, Legions of Steel. Now, Wooden Warriors is now farther along. You have to be Alt-5. That's pretty deep. Right? So Alt-5... Right, they're going to be... But before, from the uh, Legions of Steel, we were already up at 18 protection. So now it's 18 protection and then 10 natural protection, which is going to be effectively 5 more protection thereabouts. So this will put us up to 23 protection horsemen that have a heavy lance and composite crossbows. Yeah, they're very spooky. Um, so yeah, and then the randoms are again... Air, Earth, uh, Astral, Death. Air is notable, like Air Nature lets you do rainbow armor and some other stuff. Um, Astral is really nice to plug nature into your communions. Um, the Death, again, you can skelly spam. These guys aren't going to skelly spam as well as the Earth ones because they can't do summon Earth power, but they're solid. Um... Nature 2s are great to have on any nation. It opens up mass protection, which becomes really trivial. You can do mass regen and stuff with a thistle mace, I think, or you might need a little more than that. But uh, it's a super solid mage. Um, and then you have these guys who are Wailing Winds casters. Um, the nice thing about them is all of them can skelly spam because with... Uh, death 2, they can all spam a ton of skeletons. So another way to play this nation is maybe you do the, you know, archers and stuff for the first war, and then you maybe say, okay, we've got enough guys to do point buffs, we're going to lean into these guys and skelly spam. Uh, you can start thinking of some really interesting strategies with this. Like, we are literally going to fill up the battlefield with skelly spam while we have our horse archers plinking everyone with arrows, and once they run out of ammo... They're going to go file in behind all of the skelly, uh, the skeletons, which there's a few hundred of on the field, and go mop up everything with heavy lances. That looks pretty strong to me. Don't know if it looks pretty strong to you. Um, but yeah, these guys are super good. Uh, they can all cast Wailing Winds, so that gives you another amazing mid-game timing with just ubiquitous Wailing Winds. I mean, honestly... You can probably cast Wailing Winds easier than almost any other nation in Late Age. And Late Age is a nation, I mean, is an era with lots of potential Wailing Winds casters. But Late Age TNG is probably the captain of it. They can't do it the best, because to do it the best, you also need Blood Access with, like, Blood Rain later. Or, like, something else. But they can do it pretty fucking good. Especially when you consider they have these guys that also have the Fear Bows. So... Imagine, now this is like the late mid-game, we're thinking about our first war. We've got a ton of these guys who are all buffed up with Legions of Steel, Strength of Giants, right? And Wooden Warriors, maybe Mass Protection. Um, which, you probably only need like four or five of these guys to do that. And then maybe two of these guys, drop in some Wooden Warriors. Um, you've got this guy who's done Wailing Winds, Right? And then you have, like, eight more of these guys just bleeding out skeletons. So, yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. They also have uh, an armor which is a bit less encumbrance, which is significant. I don't know if it was... Yeah, th this guy does, too. It was just this uh, this first dude who has the smith bonus. It's got the, the heavier armor. Um, that's another thing, too. If you're going to have these guys doing retail, um, like, casting... It is worth considering, like, especially if you get an air random, putting some very low encumbrance item on them. You know, like, uh, I mean, even just like the robe of uh, arrow fend or whatever can be really nice if you're worried about them catching arrows. Um, and then they can do like iron skin or whatever, turn one, and then summon earth power. Because you're, if you take, if you take a, an unaging bless on these guys, um, and that's it. Like, that's all you took. Or maybe you took, like, unaging and a little bit of reinvigoration. Then these guys are going to drop from... And you forge a two-gem item with a hammer. 
like a robe of arrow defense or whatever they're called, um, which is zero encumbrance. These guys are going to drop from encumbrance eight all the way down to encumbrance three. That is a really big deal because the spellcasting encumbrance is 11. They'll go from spellcasting encumbrance 11 to in spellcasting encumbrance 3. That is a big deal. You're getting through that, like, uh, what, 8 reinvigoration effectively for every... It's not really 8 reinvigoration because... But if it's effectively 8 reinvigoration for the first 5 turns of 6 turns or 8 turns of combat or however until they first pass out. So it's really good. In addition, you're not going to be losing them to like disease and old age related things. Um, and you're going to be more resistant to winds of death, which you can also cast very casually. So there's a, a very strong reason to consider unaging on this nation. Um, anyhow, and I, some nations you can't do, like they've hard coded it so that you can't, or unaging doesn't work as well or something. I don't really know how that works with these guys. And I think a winner may have fix that with the nations that are like that. I think on aging works, but I haven't actually tested it. Um, anyhow. Yeah, I mean, these guys are amazing. I don't know what you want me to say. These are the main paths. Everything else you get, like, Astral is nice for being able to throw this cross path into a communion. Earth is nice because you can put a gem on them so they can do summon earth power. Air's nice because... Okay, no, this actually is a really important cross path. Air means these guys can magic phase. Uh, this is your only magic phase option, right? It's the, the air randoms here. So these guys can magic phase and do air elementals, or they can magic phase and skelly spam. Um, so this actually is really important, the air randoms here. Uh, the nature randoms, eh. Nature air, again, you can do rainbow armor and stuff. Not an amazing one, I don't think. Uh, but yeah, the air random is super important for magic phase, but mostly these guys are skelly spammers, wailing winds casters, and, and potentially later, later, uh, wind of death casters. But very good. And these are recruit anywhere. And then we have the celestial master. Uh, does not fly like they used to in the early age. Comes with air, water, um, astral, and then this. All these guys can do freezing mist casts, um, especially if you do power of the spheres first. Um, or if you throw it, put a, a water boosting item on them, like a bracelet. So that's something to consider for these guys. Um, you can also plug them into a communion and have them do um, Freezing Mist. Freezing Mist isn't like amazing, amazing, amazing. But it can be really good in certain si situations. But it's kind of like when you look at it, it's what their native paths like line up towards. Um, these are also going to be reasonably easy ways to put air mages into communions, though honestly you're going to have other ways to put most of these paths except water, and no, even because water you can do it with Master of the Way. You can put all these paths that these, this guy gives you into communions in other ways. What is nice about these guys is they're reliable Astral Ones. It's your only reliable Astral One Mage, so all these guys can either be in a communion or you could have them communion up together where these guys are the slaves too. Um, you know, that could be significant because then it makes putting these paths, you know, in communions even easier. I don't, honestly, I, I think if I played the nation in a multiplayer game, I'd have a better sense of what to do with these guys. But it's a, it's a little bit kind of like the situation with Middle Age TNG 2. Like, the Celestial Master doesn't have quite the same place, I don't think, that he does in, like, Early Age. I'm not exactly sure what to do with him. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, he can Magic Phase some of them, so the Air ones can Magic Phase. You get Astral 2, which is important. This is your only Astral 2 Mage. Uh, that can be pretty important. Um, they can Magic Phase with a Crystal, uh, like with a Starshine Skullcap 2. Um, so yeah, really half of these guys can potentially magic phase. Um, you have a chance of getting even better ones. I don't really know what to tell you about this guy. I'm, I'm not, I'm not super sold on him. Now we're going to, I, okay. So let's summarize a bit and we're going to do pretender design. Uh, well, I'm going to pull up and show you, uh, the, the summons first too. Okay. So, um, this is a mod inspector for late age TNG. 
you can see we've got a bunch of units we already talked about. Uh, all we're going to talk about here are the summons, okay? So the summons coming down here, we've got a few varieties. We've got the buffalo, which are not usually great. We've got the ancestral spirit. We're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about the celestial hound, the celestial servant, celestial soldier. Now, um, they each come with... Let's we'll talk about him later. Let's do these guys first. Um... These guys are two gems a pop, right? These guys are one gem a pop, but they're very mage turn inefficient to get. And these guys are three gems a pop. These guys are, they hit really hard. They have a great strength. They've got great attack and defense. They have a ton of hit points there. Uh, I think I was talking with Kirby one. He was telling me the way to think about them is they're like, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, gam herdings that you get for three gems a piece. They're really good. They've got really... I don't really think they're gam hurting. So there's something else. But they're, you know, a really good unit. They've got the built-in uh, spirit sight, which is kind of nice, so they can see in the dark. They're kind of expensive, but they're really good. So I don't know. I think they have a place. Um, they're a decent way to spend air gems. Um, these guys, which are 50% cheaper, they have similar amounts of hit points, uh, not similar amounts of protection... Um, and they have two attacks, which do less damage. Um, if you go a Weapon Bless, which we're going to explore some Weapon Bless ideas uh, as we go into Pretender Design. If you do a Weapon Bless thing, these guys may be better than the Celestial Soldier. Um, but there's like asterisks all over that, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and again, anything like, oh, which one should you get? Which one's better? It's a kind of dumb question. The answer is it depends. I can give you certain circumstances where I'm sure the Celestial Hound's better. I can give you other circumstances where I'm sure the Celestial Soldier's better. Right? So it depends. Um, but yeah, these guys basically big beefy frontline tank. These guys can be pretty good like picking off uh, thugs. Especially if you have a weapon bless on these guys. Um, they get blessed as they're jumping in. Like if you have them on attack turn one you can still bless them uh, with one. The first casting of bless will work because it'll bless like the little squares they were standing on. Um, and these guys with, especially like a weapon bless or, I mean, even any kind of attack oriented bless, uh, could do a pretty good job tearing up a thug before they get a chance to point buff a lot of times. Um, like one way to think about it is like an anti thug squad. You'd want to be able to surround a thug and maybe with a few extra ones in case you lose some. Um, and how many do you need to do that? Well, it's eight tiles and you can fit two per tile. So it's about 16. So maybe like 20 of these guys with two people blessing them to get most of them blessed before they run in or something like that. Or you could hit them with turn one strength of giants too. Um, right with a gem on one of the earth, the earth two dudes, you know, that could work as well to get these guys to, to be a bit more killy. But yeah, these guys can be really good at sniping thugs. Um, as part of a huge army, if you're going to have them on attack rear, it could be the make or break thing in a combat. Like, keeps them from running towards your archers, keeps them distracted while these guys plink them in the back. Bad news is you're probably going to lose them all, but that may be an acceptable price to pay. So I think these guys are either going to be kind of sacrificial, attack the back line sort of things as part of like a major engagement or uh, counter raiders they can be excellent at bunch of jobs for them they also patrol really well if you need to patrol things out of your of your lands celestial servants meh they have a ton of hit points they have good magic resistance um they eat all of your goddamn food i don't know if i can say a lot of great things about them if you need somebody to stand there and have 48 hit points you can probably do worse um, maybe there's some build where you get blood vengeance and you just make as many of these guys as you can. And that is not completely horrible. I don't know. I don't, I don't love them. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the ancestor spirit and the ancestor spirit is pretty interesting. All the TNGs get them. Middle-aged TNG gets them. I th actually, I'm not sure if they get them. Oh no, they don't. Uh, so they don't all get them. But, um, because Middle Age TNG doesn't have any Death Mages. I was thinking it'd be funny if they got them but didn't have Death Mages. Um, once you get Conjuration 1, all of your Death 
mages can just cast them instead and they will tend to cast them i think especially with my spell casting mod i think i fixed it so they'll call ancestors instead of like reanimate skeletons so they can do this and they get these guys they're sacred and they can paralyze um later in the game much later you at conjuration seven you can spend a death gem and get 20 of them 20 of them is not really amazing most of the time unless you have like a bless which is particularly suited for them um paralyze is not going to benefit from strength so strength buffs aren't going to help you can do there's like weird little meme builds that you can kind of do with early age tng where you have like you're more reliant on sacreds and you can like really dump your scales to do a crazy bless like twist fate and stuff is pretty funny on them attacking uh stacking defense can be pretty funny on them because like very high defense ancestral spirits with um ethereal can be pretty hard for things that magic weapons to deal with um but they still get banished um I, one thing i like is they weapons work on them so you can do like flaming weapons and all of a sudden they're now killing things death weapons there's a lot of weapons you can do um and with that the, these are the summons we're going to go back and talk about builds and we're going to first explore um we're going to first explore some weapons builds and um, the simplest thing, like, let's just look at something reasonably simple. We're going to go death weapons here on a Demi Lich, because Demi Liches start off with death, um, death three. So this is actually not expensive to get, but we get death weapons. It's incarnate. We could go even awake and have very good scales and have this guy researching. And if somebody wants to come on our capital, we'll have our Demi Lich spamming horde of skeletons at them or something. Right, you can do something as simple as this. This is going to give you death weapons on your heavy cav, armor negating attacks. Um, it's going to apply to the bows. That's that's the other reason to consider weapons blesses. Is not only is it going to apply to the hoof, which is why weapons attacks are better in some ways than they would be on other sacreds on heavy cav or on cav. Uh, it also applies to weapons. So, you know, we would now get the the death weapon effect here, which is kind of nice. Um, it also is going to work on like the, uh, our little two attack celestial hounds. And it's also going to work on our ancestral spirits. They become pretty killy with death weapons. Very cheap blessed to get. If you want to, you're like, Hey, we're going to go perfect scales and we're going to take this on this guy and we're going to get all the scales. Do something like, like this right? You're dumping a bit of income with this. You can also keep this. Maybe you're like, okay, we're only going to go, we've got decent researchers. We just go something like that, right? A lot of ways to do it. You just figure out where you want to put your scales. This is a lot more income. Uh, I'm not going to say which one's better or worse. Um, yeah. I mean, this is a totally reasonable build to do. Um, you're playing full scales early and then you'll, you'll shift in. I mean, the heavy, the sacred heavy cav are fine too. Like if you've got the money, especially once expansion's done, you can just slam these guys and just use them for the howling bows. They don't really need a bless to be really useful. And then later when death weapons comes on, it's like, great, but really you're getting it for like the, the call ancestors later. Um, so that's one way to kind of think about doing a, a, a weapons bless. You can also do... There's certain weapon blesses, and I'm not sure the best chass chassis for this, uh, but there's certain blesses like frost weapons. Um, flaming weapons, I'm, we'll check it here, the bless. Flaming weapons is incarnate. Um, frost weapons is not. There's no earth weapons. Solar weapons we could get. Withering weapons we could get, and poison weapons we could get. So there's a build which you could do, which I have no idea the best pat chassis, or you wouldn't need to get all of them, right? But you could do poison weapons. Uh, wait, we'll probably get one too many here. Poison weapons, frost weapons, decay weapons, withering weapons, and then um, Something like this. And this is now kind of expensive, right? But um, 
solar weapons, and then we'll get major fire resistance here too. Um, and we'll get minor magic, <laughs> minor magic resistance, or you could get spirit sight if you wanted to pay an extra path for death. Now, uh, are we going to get perfect scales with this? No. So you're going to go imprisoned. We're going to have to start sacking some scales. Now these scales are super important if you're doing barb heavy calf, because you're going to need both of these. Uh, to slam out a lot of heavy cab. I don't know which one's more important for heavy cab. It's going to depend a lot on a province. Like a farmland, you're going to worry more about the productivity, but a forest, you're probably going to worry, or a mountain, you're going to worry more about the, the ordered turmoil. But it may be you worry about one more than another. If you're going to actually play this nation in a multiplayer game you, and you want to spam out barb heavy horsemen, you want to see which of these you can sacrifice a little bit of. I probably should, should have done that before this guide. Um, we might do a single player playthrough of them too, but... That would be actually kind of fun to play against the AI. I might I might take these guys for a whirl uh, in single player, but um, you could do something. Now, obviously, you don't need all these things, right? This is like kind of silly and overkill, but um, you could do it. Like this is plus nine income, and we have this crazy weird bless. Uh, which is active turn one. And so these are all going to apply to the hoof attacks and whatnot of our weapons. So we're going to be just lighting people up with our heavy calf. Um, yeah, I'm not actually sure what you... I guess we'd get some more points here. Yeah, I mean, you'd probably do something like this, and frost weapons, you still need four, three, one. So this one, you'd switch to, like, minor sh fire resistance, and now we've got three air things to play around with, so we could, like, stack on far shot, shoot things a lot farther with our weapons. So we could do something silly like this, and a really plink the back line. You put your little calf here, these guys, in separate formations and have them fire random so you're more likely to hit mages. Uh, I don't know, Strength of Earth probably. I mean, we have pretty good scales. We have like, we don't have perfect income scales because we had to sacrifice this, but you could if you wanted to even go perfect income scales. Though you're going to start getting, uh, I don't really recommend Misfortune <laughs> Drain 3. Um, so yeah, I probably wouldn't do that. I'd probably stick, stick right here for this one. But I mean, you can plink this around. It could be if you did, I would actually prefer to not fully dump temperature. Like, like if you could get by with this, this might be better. Oh God, we still got more points to spend. Get another, or get, maybe get a minor shock resistance. I mean, something like this would be pretty terrifying, actually. <laughs> like, that's actually really scary. And those little, like, Kirby and I were, he's giving me the words in Discord about how the Celestial Soldier is always better than the Celestial Hound. Celestial Hounds that get blessed with this on turn one and strength the giants and are on attack rear are going to fuck some, some shit up. Like, they're going to die unless they're trying to kill a thug. But if they're trying to kill a thug and they get hit with Strength of Giants and this Bless turn one before they take off, they're going to be murdering some stuff whenever they land. I mean, it's going to be a little ridiculous. Anyway. This is one way to take the nation, is to do something like this, like a non-incarnate weapons Bless. There's not many... And the cool thing, like, if you want to try this in a multiplayer game, there's not many nations that this is a good idea. I'm not going to say this is the best way to play Late Age TNG, but I am going to say this is a viable way. You can play this. Oh, wait, shit, we can't actually do this. Oh, fuck. So you take poison weapons off this. Because we don't want to take death scales. Fuck that in Late Age. I'm not going to recommend that. Um, I mean, it's interesting taking poison weapons, but... I mean, that gives us a lot more points to play with. Something like this. Poison weapon is not even amazing. But yeah, we're not taking, we're not dumping growth here, not in late age. So, I mean, this is a build, we'll save it. 
Apartments with blessed not fulfilled. What did y'all need that I didn't give you? Oh, cold scales. Problem with coal is it's going to slow down our heavy cav a lot. So that's definitely something to think about. Taking fro frost weapon is one of the best non-incarnate weapons, though. I mean, hell, we've only got three now. Okay, so something like this. This is going to slow down. This is going to, I think, turn your heavy cab into map move. We'll see. I don't know. Oh. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, these guys might still be map move too. I think they would be. I don't really know the math. These guys, I have a feeling, are going to be maybe map move one and cold. It's the way of the world, though. Uh, okay, we'll save this guy. So that's one kind of build. Um, next up, we're going to look at full scales. Like, we got pretty close to full scales with that other one, but if you really, really, really want to lean into scales, you can still get the sacred dudes, like the sacred cav, because they've got the howling bow, which is still nice. If we're really going to lean into scales, what do we do? We're going to mostly probably ignore the the sacred dudes for expansion. Um, God, if I can find T and Chi here. Uh, we're going to lean into this unaging idea, right? So we're not going to go, we're not going to get a lot of dominion because we don't think we're going to need it. We're going to get unaging. That might be a better chassis for us. I don't, know, I don't think so. Um, you get unaging. We get a little bit of poison resistance, so we don't have to worry quite as much about foul vapors. Uh, and then we could get... Um, I think the other thing I would consider getting here is this. Uh, get a bit of reinvigoration. And that's it. All right. Like, if you want to, you can get some path diversity here. Right? But you don't need to get all of that because you've got a lot of path diversity already on TNG. You just pick out what you would want. Maybe you get a little bit of... I don't know. You you figure it out. Uh, and we're going to go in prison and we're going to get all the scales. Like, literally all the scales. And not literally. We can't quite afford all of them. But we're getting most of them. Would you take this over here? I think this... We've got pretty good researchers. 13 a turn? Yeah, I think magic 1 is probably fine. I mean, you go up to magic 2. Like, maybe you do like this. I don't know if you... The thing is, you get, in some ways, diminishing returns from going up more magic. Because, like, the first one, you're getting one more magic. Like, you're going from 13 to 14, right? So you're getting one as a percent of 13. For the last one, you're going from 15 to 16. So you're getting one as a percent of 15. So it's not quite as good. Um... But maybe something like this, and then you get one more point to spend up here. Like, I think we'd probably take death in this case. Oh, we could twice burn our god if we need to. But uh, is there any cross paths here that I would really look at real hard? We already have air earth. I mean, uh, astral earth. Yeah, I don't know. I think this would probably be fine. And this is like a full scales build. This is the build that you would really be really heavily leaning into these guys, right? And these guys, this build is going to scale very, very well, right? If you're playing on like a really big map, I'd probably do something like this. Because it's going to make all these Recruit Anywhere mages a lot nicer. Like a lot nicer. They're going to get rid of unaging. I mean, they're going to get rid of old age, right? It's going to be super nice. They're going to have way more reinvigoration. It's going to be a really big, fat, hairy deal. Um, and then especially if you start putting some really low encumbrance or even zero encumbrance armor on them for three gems, I'm sorry, for two gems, they become way better combat mages. Now, again, the kinds of mages you want to do that aren't the ones, like, this guy probably a lower priority because his job is probably going to do Strength of Giants, Legions, to steal a few times and then be asleep, right? But for, like, these guys who are going to be, or, you know, specifically these guys who are probably going to be doing more skelly spam, you know, there might be a bit higher priority for the gear. The gear's going to be nice on all of them, but it's nice to get rid of the old age. I think you could have a lot of fun with a lot of different builds. Like that first one we showed with death weapons, you could do with thunder weapons, right? There's so many different ways to do it. 
Um, you also could play these guys with a Titan, right? And the nice thing about playing with the Titan is if there's some kind of nut you can't crack by throwing more heavy cav with uh, strength of giants on them at it. Like if that, if you can't, if throwing strength of giants on heavy cav is not going to solve your problem and shooting it with arrows isn't going to solve your problem. These guys don't have fire access. Yeah, it'd be nice if we could do flaming arrows with this nation. We can't. It's, uh, that'd be an interesting path to maybe take on a god, like a god with fire access as a titan that's dormant. Um, well, maybe we'll do that next. So, like, if you can't solve it with arrows and you might want a god to solve that problem, then you could consider a titan. I would probably look for a titan that can magic phase and has fire. Like this guy, the Kami of the Sun. It's also sick. It's got built-in sight vengeance, which is kind of cool. Or this guy, the Nataraj with four arms, very spooky. And this is a viable thing, so you could go dormant with this. Thing is, we're gonna be sacrificing a lot to get this chassis. Um, probably gonna want this. You, if you're using this guy as a super combatant, which is the reason you get him, you want to be able to magic phase, but you also don't want to be super easy to plink down with magic duel. You, I mean, honestly, the cheapest one would probably be something like this. Maybe you do that. Uh, I don't really know what I would get here. I mean, Solar Weapons is not actually horrible. Oh, actually, I forgot. Yeah, and we only need four. Okay, so like something like this. Why don't we put Reinvigoration on? Okay, something like this is expensive, right? You remember how we were, a lot of these other builds, we had really good scales? Yeah, this build we don't. So, like, you probably start doing some trades. You're probably going to dump temperature, which temperature is a big hit to your income, boys. Like, I, it's, it is definitely a scale you dump a lot, which I would recommend dumping a lot, but it's not a scale you always want to dump. Like, you're going to be getting a lot less money. Do that. I mean, this is acceptable, right? We can still do lot or like really good expansion with this and then you have a titan that can come out and trust me this guy can crack some nuts so this would be like another viable build i think for late age t and chi where you've got this huge badass that's going to come online and start causing really big problems and you've got really good scales for expansion and money and stuff throughout the game um you had to dump luck which kind of sucks in the late age because just getting gems from luck is more impactful in the late age which is a gem poor era but it's fine. You can do it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a ton more builds. Um, the I think that, okay, let's do closing thoughts here because we're now over an hour. Uh, closing thoughts on late age TNG. Uh, perhaps more than almost any other nation in the game, this is a horde faction. You can just slam heavy horsemen and slam these guys early and do Strength of Giants, Legions of Steel, cause a ton of problems you've got great scaling into the mid game wooden warriors mass protection wailing winds wind of death you can do communions um and you can have just enormous quantities of troops so you've got a lot going for you in like the early and mid game um the thing you don't really have going for you is the super late game like, lots of nations in the late age have blood access. Late age, like, a lot of nations. Like, all, I, I don't, I, I'd be interested to add it up. I feel like it's at least half or something like that. It's a lot. And blood tends to be, but it's not like in Dominions 3 or 4 where you, like, needed to be a blood nation to to, to win the late game. You can win the, le the late game without that. Like, don't feel like you cannot go into the late game with this nation. You can. But... You're not going to be like, it's not your strong suit, right? So if you go in, if I was planning on taking this nation into the late game, I would try to be thinking about which global I would want to control or something like that to give me a good shot to like, to win it, you know, the late game. Um, 
but you've got like amazing middle uh like early you got amazing amazing early game timings uh you got pretty good late game timings oh one thing i just probably to mention too is like talking about nuts you can't crack you also have horde of skeletons that's going to crack a lot of nuts but this guy also will have air randoms right and i mentioned this guy for uh, magic phase but sometimes like super combatants sometimes air elementals are going to crack nuts you can't crack otherwise so keep that in mind when you're thinking about like what you need um but yeah you've got great early game timings you've got amazing early mid game late mid game timings and you've got a decent late game you know a late game with like literally wailing winds everywhere um huge hordes of troops uh communions putting all the buffs on those troops like you're a nation that scales pretty well. I don't think you're gonna. It's while it, it's a really cool faction and it can do a lot of good things. It's also good against some of the nations which are really strong. Like it's pretty decent against uh, like Vetti Hyman stuff. Like Vetti Hyman in general doesn't want heavy cab running at them while they're doing their point buffing, so, and they also usually don't want to be plinked down with archer fire while they're doing point buffing and stuff like that. So. That's kind of interesting. I, that said, you're not really going to want to run and fight Rim Vetti most of the time in Cold 3 with these guys, but you've got some tools to deal with it. Um, you know, you've you've got magic weapons to potentially shoot uh, Lemurian ghosts and stuff. You've got you've got ways to handle some of the stronger nations in the game, and you've got you know you can do wither bones and stuff too. Um, yeah, I think this is a really cool action and it plays a lot differently it's kind of one of the things like it's easy to look at dominions and see like oh then it you know like maybe you get bored of it or something like i guarantee you guys if you play this nation like a horde faction in a multiplayer game it's going to be a pretty different experience for you i mean maybe it's not maybe your experience is always you get dogpiled and beat up on or something and maybe it happens again but uh it, it does i think you will find that this is a, a very aggressive kind of nation uh, especially for the early mid game like in the early game uh, anyhow i hope you've enjoyed the the guide and uh thanks again to all my patreon sponsors who uh yeah make me feel kind of committed to the channel and all of this stuff so and thank you for everybody for watching um yeah go out and uh join a game as late hg see ya